Happy Sabbath. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to see half of your faces out there tonight. I can't see anybody behind the lights. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's a pleasure to know that you are all out there. Amen? Um, most of you who have been attending throughout the week, how many of you have attended throughout the week? Can I see your hands? I, I see something happening out there. Um, I ask that question because you know I love to ask you questions which require you to raise your hand, and now tonight I'm going to have to struggle because I can't see anything. But uh, I, I pray that God will give us a dynamic where we will be able to connect, even though I can't see many of you. Um, I hope that this room can become very small and that we can truly connect tonight. Amen? Uh, I would like to, before I pray, for those of you who have not been here throughout the week, I just want to share a little bit about my testimony. Uh, very briefly, I was in the hip-hop industry. I uh, was in a rap group that was signed to an eight-album contract with EMI Records back in 1994. Uh, our group appeared on Soul Train and Rap City, and we were written up in various magazines. Um, I was introduced to the Adventist message in the middle of recording our first album. And I was so amazed by what I had learned in the Bible. And let me tell you, I had studied many different religions. I had studied Nation of Islam, all the various black movement uh, religions that were prominent in the hip-hop culture and uh, when I was introduced to Adventism I saw a unity and consistency that I had not seen anywhere else and so I decided that I was gonna take the three angels messages and put it in my hip-hop music and so there I was in the clubs on Friday night warning people of the wrath to come <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, throwing out great controversies on stage in the midst of people throwing up marijuana and alcohol, bottles of alcohol. And um, the Lord began to speak to me, and in essence, He said to me, uh, uh, You cannot call people out of Babylon if you are still in Babylon yourself. And so I realized that I could not mix truth with error, light with darkness, and I decided to leave behind this $800,000 contract, not knowing what God had in store for me. I remember praying and asking God, God, if you take me from behind this microphone, please put me behind another whereby I can still reach your people. Was not thinking of ministry and had no idea that this day I'd be standing before an audience like this preaching the gospel behind a microphone uh, well a headpiece now and so uh, I, just, I am thankful to be able to stand here before you tonight and beloved I want you to be prepared for tonight because I tell you tonight's message you're gonna need to be prepared amen so I'm gonna ask if you would just bow your heads with me as we offer up Another word of prayer very quickly, and then we will get into the message. Heavenly Father, I ask that your spirit would tabernacle with us tonight. Father, prepare your people for what they are about to hear. Father, many, if not all, will be challenged. Challenge us tonight, O oh Lord, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to start tonight's message. Oh man, that is so much better. Oh, this excites me. I want to start tonight's message with a quote that some of you have heard before, but I will read it again because it sets up the importance of tonight's message. It comes from Councils to Teachers, page 255. <coughs> it reads, on a certain occasion, the celebrated actor or rather a celebrated actor was dining with the Archbishop of Canterbury 
And the archbishop said to him, pray, tell me, why is it that you actors affect your audiences so powerfully by speaking of things imaginary, while we ministers affect our audiences so little by speaking of things real? And, and the actor replied, with due submission to your grace, permit me to say that the reason is plain. It lies in the power of enthusiasm. We on the stage speak of things imaginary as if they were real, while you in the pulpit speak of things real as if they were imaginary. Beloved, I want you to know tonight that you will be challenged. <laughs> Let me give you an example. How many of you have an invisible friend? Now, you all who are raising your hands are only raising your hands because we've been, we've been through some things together. <laughs> Those of you who have not raised your hands have thought, I have just come into a place of crazy people. But, beloved, we learn that if we are Christians, if we profess to believe in Jesus Christ, then we have an invisible friend. Amen? Amen. Jesus tells us, lo, I am what? With you always, which means that he is with us even when? Now, I remember being at a church once and I was praying Lord, I want to see you on the pulpit with me when I preach. I remember I was visiting a church, and, and as I was praying this prayer and saying, Lord, I just want you to show me your glory, show me your grace. I want you to be with me, imbue me with your power as I speak, Lord. And I remember going to the church that morning, and as I walked in, I was handed a bulletin, and I did not look at the bulletin. I went up, took my seat, and as I was praying, Lord, show me your presence in a supernatural way. And as I was agonizing this prayer and feeling the Spirit of God with me, I decided I better look at the bulletin to see what the order of service was. And when I looked at the front of the bulletin, my mouth dropped open. It was a picture of a pastor at the pulpit preaching. Jesus was standing next to him <laughs> with one hand on his shoulder and the other hand extended to heaven. Ooh, you know you don't see church bulletins like that, right? <laughs> you know that was something supernatural. Beloved, what I'm trying to say to you is that in a very real sense, Jesus is present with us. Amen? And so tonight's message, beloved, will require you to muster all the childlike faith you can possibly muster. That's why Jesus said, except ye become as little what? You shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Because, beloved, little children believe the word of God. Amen? We are told. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How many of you believe that? How many of you have an invisible enemy? How many of you really believe that? <laughs> Beloved, we are in a supernatural conflict. And by the way, the, 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 the message, the name of the message tonight is supernatural warfare. <clears throat> we are in a supernatural warfare against supernatural enemies. And we are told in Signs of the Times, written February 17th, 1914, we are told we do not understand as we should the great conflict going on between invisible agencies, the controversy between loyal and disloyal angels. Over every man, good and evil angels strive. This is no make-believe conflict. This is no mimic battle. 
We've got more than human beings in the room tonight. Beloved, let me tell you how serious this warfare is. This warfare is so serious that there are angels who will, as the words come out of my mouth, who will take those words and try to, 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 to rearrange them before they get to your ears. And if they can't do that, they will be standing in front of you to block the very words from entering into your heart. We're talking about supernatural warfare. This is no make-believe battle. And so, beloved, if we are dealing with supernatural forces, if we are dealing with a supernatural foe, the Bible tells us in the same chapter, Ephesians 6, if you would turn there with me, Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says in verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the what? Wiles of the devil. Did you know that the devil has weapons? That's why in Isaiah 54, verse 17, the Bible says, No weapon, what? Formed against us shall prosper. Now, beloved, you may be thinking physical weapon, but the Bible is speaking of spiritual weapon because the devil has the power to manufacture spiritual weapons. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says that we should not be ignorant of the devil's what? Devices. Now, let me ask you, how many of you sing that song, No Weapon Formed Against Us Shall Prosper? You just know the verse, yes, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. How is that going to be true if you don't even know what the weapons are? If we are ignorant of his devices, beloved, how are we going to stand against those devices if we don't even know what they are? So, I'm going to need you tonight to put on your child hat. You know what that means? I'm going to need you tonight to, ha to get the mind of a child to believe like a child, not in ignorance, but, beloved, beloved, but by faith. Amen? I want to share with you tonight the weapons of the enemy. And as I share these weapons, you will say, <laughs> we've got a kid up here preaching. But beloved, let me remind you that this is no make-believe conflict. So are you ready? The devil's weapon, number one. The devil has eyeglasses. You say, okay, Pastor, here we go. <laughs> eyeglasses. Let me ask you, beloved, what do eyeglasses help you to do? Eyeglasses help you not only to see, but supposedly to see what? Better. <laughs> the devil has eyeglasses. Beloved, have you ever been tempted to look on the other side of the grass and say, man, it sure looks better over there? Anyone, don't raise your hand. <laughs> you see, beloved, you say, well, where can we find that in the Bible? Listen, you remember that in the book of Genesis, turn there with me, Genesis chapter 2, or rather Genesis chapter 3, Satan comes to Eve in the garden, and uh, the Bible says there in verse uh, 4, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die if you eat this fruit. For God does know in the day you eat thereof, then your what? Your eyes shall be what? Opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, question for you. When Eve first looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, did the tree look good for food? No. <laughs> Why not? <clears throat> Because God said the tree was not what? 
good for food. So Eve had no desire for this tree. She had no, no, no reason to, to say, man, I was sure I wish I could eat from that tree. And she says this to Satan. Satan, God told me that the tree is not good for food. And Satan said, hold on, Eve, you're not seeing right. Why don't you try on my handy dandy, super duper, help you to see better eyeglasses. And now watch what it says in verse 6. And when the woman, what? saw that the tree was what? Good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit and did eat and gave unto her husband, and he did eat. Beloved, let me tell you something. When sin looks desirable to you, you now know that you are wearing the devil's eyeglasses. Anybody ever worn the devil's eyeglasses? <laughs> this is no make-believe conflict. And some of you think I'm making this up. Our High Calling, page 319. If you permit the devil to, he will tell you that your troubles are most grievous. The sorest troubles that any mortal ever bore. He will place his magnifying glasses before your eyes <laughs> and present everything to you in an exaggerated form to overwhelm you with discouragement. Anybody ever worn the devil's eyeglasses? Anybody ever looked at, you know glasses make things look bigger. You ever look at a problem that you're having and say, man, this is bigger than God. You ever magnify your problem to the place where, where, where the devil gets all the glory? In fact, beloved, the devil tried to put these glasses on Jesus when he took him up to the mount and did what? Showed him all the glory of the kingdom. But Jesus did not allow himself to look through those glasses. Beloved, we are talking about supernatural warfare. How many of you believe the devil has eyeglasses? Yes, beloved, because you've all worn them before. Oh, we've all worn them before. <laughs> Amen. Beloved, not only does the devil have eyeglasses, I'd like for you to turn again with me to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 the Bible tells us, and you know, beloved, praise God. The next time that your eyes tell you that sin is desirable, you can now recognize, oh, I must have on the devil's eyeglasses. Lord, help me to take these things off so I can see clearly. Amen? Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Notice what it says. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Rather, verse 16. I'm sorry. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now this word darts, did you know the devil had darts? But see, that's, 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 I want to give you the Greek of this word. The Greek of this word darts is bellows, which means missiles. Did you know the devil had missiles? Do we have any kids out there? Oh, my goodness. Do I have any kids out? Do I have any children in the audience? <laughs> Is this going to be a difficult one? Do I have any children in the audience? <laughs> Amen. Please, thank you. Work with me. Amen. The devil has missiles, beloved. The Bible tells us here. So the question is, what in the world are these missiles? Let me give you a couple of them. First of all, there's the thought bomb. Have you ever been walking around just somewhere minding your own business? <laughs> when all of a sudden, out of the clear blue hemisphere, some thought comes, Shh. anybody ever had the experience? Now, beloved, the, here's the problem. 
We, are, we walk around all day being blown to pieces by the devil's thought bombs because we don't know that they're thought bombs. Instead, beloved, when we recognize that the devil has thought bombs, we can say, Lord, I detect a thought bomb in the hemisphere. Knock it down before it does its damage. Now you say, thoughts, come on, thoughts, listen. For thousands of years, Satan has been experimenting upon the properties of the human mind, and he has learned to know it well. By his subtle workings in these last days, he is linking the human mind with his own, imbuing it with his thoughts. Medical ministry, page 112, 111. The devil has power to imbue his thoughts into your mind. And how does he do it? He does it through the media. Amen? Beloved, he has a thousand ways to do it. But what happens, beloved, is that when we become uh, aware of his devices, now as we walk around and, and, and sense that bomb going off, we can recognize this is a thought bomb. Help me, Lord. Not only does he have the thought bomb, he's got the feel bomb. F-E-E-L. You ever wake up in the morning? You're cranky? You're not sure why? It's like a stealth bomb. It just comes in unannounced. And all of a sudden, you're moody and it just... It's because the bomb slightly, silently came in and detonated and you didn't even realize it. You don't understand that those feelings of, of anger and all those things, those feelings that are unchristlike, are part of the devil's arsenal. The feel bomb. What about the sleep bomb? You know, the one that goes off in church. <laughs> Come on, beloved, does the devil have a sleep bomb? You read again the writings of, the, of, of Spirit of Prophecy, and it says there that when we fall asleep in church, it is the work of the enemy to prevent us from hearing the very words we may have needed. You heard me say before, it is not coincidence that while you're out those doors, your, eye, your eyes are bright shining, and as soon as you walk in, I'm so tired. It is not, but anybody ever pick up the Bible at home to say, you know what, I think I want to read a chapter. And the next thing you remember is waking up. <laughs> Do you think that's coincidence? Or when you go down to pray and, and you don't make it past a couple of seconds. That's not coincidence, beloved. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me tell you about the iron pen. The iron pen. Jeremiah 17, 1 tells us that the sins of Judah are written with a pen of iron on the tables of their hearts. And so now let me tell you something, beloved. God never writes sin upon the table of our hearts. God doesn't want to put sin there. You understand? God will write our sins in a book, but he doesn't write it on our hearts because he's trying to what? Cleanse our hearts. But when you sin, the devil will take out that iron pen and engrave it on your heart. So now 20 years later, you're just hanging out in your living room, and all of a sudden, this thought of some sin that you did 20 years ago pops up in your mind. And all of a sudden, you start reminiscing. Oh, yeah, those were the days. And the devil pulls out that iron pen again, and he engraves it even deeper. Beloved, let me tell you, that's why, you know, the devil loves when kids say, you know, let me make my own mistakes. and let me, Because he's just having a field day with that iron pen because he knows if and when they ever give their life to Christ, it will be that much harder for them to maintain pure thoughts because of all the ink. <laughs> That is on their hearts. And then, beloved, there is sonic warfare. Did you know that the devil has sonic warfare? 
Have you ever been in the supermarket? Minding your own business? And then that song comes on? You know the one I'm talking about? The one that you used to do your stuff to back in the day? (laughs) And all of a sudden, beloved, what's going on? Sonic warfare. All these thoughts and feelings and emotions begin to rise up in your heart. Anybody ever? You're being bashful now. You see, beloved, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. What about nerve gas? You want to know what nerve gas is? Do you know anybody who everything gets on their nerves? (laughs) Nerve gas, beloved, the devil irritates you. The devil just works you up so much that everything, she get on my nerves. He get on my nerve. Everything gets on your nerves. And beloved, that is an anti-Christ spirit. We're talking, beloved, about supernatural warfare. And then are uh, the devil's booby traps. These are what I like to call booby traps. You know, you may be in your house. Women, this is a popular booby trap for you, maybe. You walk into the bathroom, and the bathroom is not the way that (laughs) you think it should be after a man uses it. (laughs) And all of a sudden, you feel the great controversy about to just take place all over you. And you were just happy, just a minute. You were just singing songs, and you walk into the bathroom, and you begin to tremble. Because no one else can understand, but that's your booby trap. That's the thing that just sends you off the hook. Anybody have a booby trap? And the devil knows, beloved, let me tell you, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is the abyss. You know what an abyss is? An abyss is something that separates two objects so that they can't cross over. And sometimes, beloved, many of our young people and even older people get to the place where they think they have gone so far from God that he can't love them anymore. The devil says, you've gone too far. You've crossed over the abyss. There is no abyss when it comes to God, beloved. Jesus Christ spanned the abyss, and he says no matter what you've done, if you repent, there is always a short bridge back. But the devil has used this abyss and led people even to the brink of suicide. He used this abyss on Judas. You know what he told Judas? You went too far. Now go hang yourself. That's what he told the angels who wanted to come back. You know, maybe we better turn back to God. No, you've gone too far. You may as well join me in the rebellion. Beloved, we're dealing with supernatural warfare. But I want to tell you, beloved, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3, 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal either. Ah, you didn't get it. (laughs) Beloved. Not only does the devil have weapons, but God has weapons for his people too. Amen. You see, beloved, as we face a supernatural foe, as we cease to put these things and just say, oh, you know, that just... uh," As we begin to realize that we are dealing with a supernatural enemy... We understand that we must now ourselves get connected with one who himself is what? Supernatural. And beloved, when we get connected to a supernatural Jesus Christ, he says, now I've got some supernatural weapons for you to use against your supernatural foe. So are you interested in finding out what these supernatural weapons are? Let's go find three of them. Matthew chapter 2. And verse 1, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible tells us that when Jesus was born, he received three gifts, and I like to call them weapons. 
Matthew 2, the Bible says, and when, verse 11, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts. What were the gifts? Gold, what else? Frankincense and myrrh. There go your first three weapons, beloved. What does gold represent in the scripture? Gold represents faith, that the trying of your faith be much more precious than what? Gold that perisheth. Beloved, faith is the very first weapon that God has given us to fight against the enemy. You want to know what faith is? You all know this. Faith is knowing without knowing. Amen. Faith is seeing without seeing. So, beloved, in order for me to access any other supernatural weapon of God, I must first possess the gold. Amen? This is how Jesus overcame himself. These three weapons were the three weapons that Jesus was given as a symbol to explain, to describe how he would overcome. And, beloved, we are told that we overcome by the faith of Jesus. So anybody need gold power? But it doesn't stop there because then it says he was given frankincense. What is frankincense? What does it represent? It represents prayer, the prayers of the saints. Prayer is our next weapon, beloved. It is our two-way communication system with God. And so, beloved, as we exercise faith and as we begin to use that prayer, you know the devil will come and do everything he can to interrupt the sound waves. To cut off that flow of incense. We overcome, one, by having the faith of Christ, two, by having a continual communion with Jesus, and that's why the devil doesn't want us to pray. Amen? Because he knows, beloved, that if we begin to use frankincense power, we will begin to gain the victory over him. Can anybody use some frankincense power? But then, beloved, this is one I love. It's myrrh. I like to call it myrrh power. What was myrrh used for in the scripture? It was, it was used to embalm the, the dead. So I like to call this myrrh dead power. You want to know what dead power is? So uh, when you're driving in the car and uh, <laughs> that person cuts you off and you got up this morning and prayed, Father, give me myrrh power, you know what happens? No response. Why? Because you're what? <laughs> you're... <laughs> You're dead. Dead power, dead to self. Amen? Amen? Oh, man, you guys are making me work for this. <laughs> Beloved, Jesus was anointed with myrrh even before his trial. You realize when the Roman soldiers came to him in the garden, they expected to find a living man, but Jesus was already dead. <sighs> uh, let me try it this way. <laughs> When they came and they said, when you slap a dead man, what happens? Nothing. You, you get that? When you spit upon a dead man, what happens? Nothing. Jesus was D-O-A. <laughs> he was dead <laughs> on arrival. <laughs> They came, he was dead, beloved. Do you and I need myrrh power? Yes, indeed, beloved. We need to be dead. We're having too many near-death experiences. Ooh. So, beloved, we have gold power, we have frankincense power, we have myrrh power. And let me tell you something, beloved, let me ask you this. Are you ready? How many of you would like to fly? How many of you would like power to fly? Isaiah 40, verse 30. Well, you, you look at me, you fly. <laughs> Isaiah 40, 31. 
They that wait upon the Lord shall do what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with what? Wings like eagles. Beloved, you can have anti-gravitational power. You don't get it. When the devil comes with that, with that gravitational pull of sin, and before you would just fall, 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 now the temptation comes and you say, Lord, grant me those supernatural wings. Help me to rise above this temptation. Anybody want to fly? <laughs> Beloved, in order to get the wings, you've got to have the faith of a what? Child. Now, please don't let me see you leaving here today doing something like this. That's not what I'm talking about, amen? I'm talking about, beloved, having a childlike faith in the word of God. So if God says, I can make you fly, beloved, when Jesus walked upon water, it was to show that he was giving us power over nature so that we can walk above the waters of our own sin. So now he says, I give you supernatural wings, and when temptation comes, you can say, Lord, grant me those wings, help me to fly. And when, when somebody knows, man, he should be getting mad, in your mind you're saying, this person doesn't know I have supernatural wings. <laughs> I am rising above this temptation. Childlike faith. Beloved, it's almost like living in a comic book, but better. I know by the end of this message, you will either think I'm crazy or I just really love Jesus. <laughs> Beloved, I really love Jesus. And here's another weapon I share, but I want to share with, again, for those of you who are not here. In Matthew 3 and verse 11, John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is... Mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost and with fire. Now I'd like to hear a real big... When I say that, I want you to... I want you, ready? I want you to say two words. Flame on. Are you ready? One, two, three. Beloved, do you understand what it means when God says, I want to give you power to flame on? You see, beloved, um, the Bible says that Laodicea is either warm or cold. And, and, and many of our young people are cool. See, the devil wants you to be cool. You, <laughs> the devil wants you to be cool, but Jesus says, no, my son, I want you to flame on. I want you to become like a human torch of my love. Flame on. Beloved, when you flame on, the devil can't come close because he cannot stand in the presence of God's fire. So anybody want the ability to flame on? He says, just be born of the Spirit. Give yourself to me, humble yourself, and I will give you power to flame on. And beloved, let me tell you, there's nothing more exciting than a Christian who is on fire. The world sees too many Christians who just look like regular old human beings. We need some supernatural Christians who are just covered in fire. And then, beloved, there is the power. Well, let me ask you this. Anybody interested in having power to become invisible? Say, now you go too far, Pastor. <laughs> Shall I show you the verse? Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, verse 1, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for you are dead and your life is what? Hid in Christ. <laughs> you still don't get it? Beloved, when the devil comes looking for you, 
He does not see you. He cannot find you because you are invisible because you are in Christ. Anybody interested in becoming invisible? Ooh, beloved, let me tell you. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. And when we understand that, beloved, we will begin to see our Christianity as something that is supernatural. The devil will be like, where in the world did he go? We can't find him. Why? Because he is hidden in Christ. Beloved, there is a shield of grace. The Bible tells us the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and deliver them. That's a shield, beloved. Anybody interested in having a shield around you? Beloved, do you realize I like to imagine that as I am praying, <clears throat> let me do it like this. Little prayer, thin shield. Much prayer, thick shield. So you pray a little, and then when you walk out on the street that day, and you think your shield's going to do something, the devil just throws one of his darts and whoosh, right through your shield. Anybody ever had the experience? But Lord, I prayed for three whole minutes this morning. Amazing Grace, page 33. Many in this corrupt age have so small a supply of the grace of God that in many instances their defense is broken down by the first assault and fierce temptations take them captive. The shield of grace can preserve all unconquered by the temptations of the enemy, though surrounded with the most corrupting influences. Anybody interested? in walking around with your shield of grace. Whew. Beloved, with such an arsenal like this, why are we walking around getting beaten to death? Could it be because we on the stage speak of things imaginary, as if they were real, while you in the pulpit and in the churches speak of things real as if they were what? Imaginary. And then, beloved, to top it all off, oh, oh, let me share with you one more weapon, and then we're going to go to the ultimate weapon of weapons. There's a whole list I'm jumping through. But here's one weapon that you really need to learn how to use. The stones of fire. You know, Romans 13, or rather Romans 12 tells us, do not be overcome of evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. And it says, by so doing, you will heap what? Coals of what? fire upon your enemies' heads. Now, let me tell you what this means, beloved. The coals of fire are not things that you throw at your enemy so you can injure them. <laughs> Those coals of fire represent the coals of love. They are the stones of love. So when someone does something to you that is like, let me show you something. You take out one of those and you throw it at them. <laughs> let me give you a little bit of love here. You understand what I'm saying? You return Good for what? Evil. Anybody need some stones? <laughs> and so, beloved, when God begins to lay out these weapons for us, and when he begins to, to, to bring our minds, remember, when he brings us into his school and begins to train us to fight the fight of faith, and now he's saying, I've got these weapons as well that you can use against the enemy. Beloved, why in the world would we want to stay away from Jesus? when he is doing everything that he can to equip us to fight the fight of faith. Now, are you ready for the ultimate weapon? Here it goes, beloved. 2 Peter. Rather, 1 Peter. <clears throat> Chapter 4. 
and verse 1. When you get there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same what? Mind. The Bible tells us that the mind of Christ is a weapon. And beloved, it is the ultimate weapon because the Bible tells us in Philippians 2, 5, let this what? Mind be in you, which was also in who? Christ Jesus. Now we're going to have to unpack this a little bit. Is that okay? Because very often we say, let this mind be in you. And we just go around, let this mind be in you. And we don't understand what it means. So the question is, how do I get the what? The mind of Christ. Are you ready to find the answer? The Bible tells us that by beholding, we become what? Changed. Now, if we want to behold and become changed into the image of Christ, what must we be beholding? Christ. If we want the life of Christ to become a reality in us, then we must be beholding his life. Now, let me tell you, how do we do that? I want to read to you a powerful, powerful statement. It would be well for us to spend. A thoughtful, some of you are about to pass out because <laughs> you know what's coming next. It would be well to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. Anybody ever heard of STV? <laughs> Spiritual television. You, you, you know why you never heard of it? It's amazing that you never heard of it and all of you have it. It's, it's incredible. All of you have STV, but you don't know what it is. <laughs> Anybody have an imagination out there? We should go through the life of Christ praying, allowing our what? Imaginations to grasp each scene of Christ's life. But the devil told you that imagination was evil. Am I telling the truth? Either that or the devil has captured your imagination by watching all the other stuff on TV. So now when you go down to pray and try to see Jesus, try to see what he went through, try to see him on the cross, all you're seeing is what you saw on TV. You see, beloved, we are being told that if we want the mind of Christ, we've got to live the life of Christ. We've got to behold his life. And it's so beautiful, beloved, because what happens when we begin to behold the life of Christ is that we begin to learn how to live his life. How can we live his life if we don't behold it? And let me share with you something amazing, beloved. I remember one, one, one evening I was praying. And I was asking the Lord, Lord, you know, you know I want to get a closer, a closer view of you. I want to see you and get to know you. And I remember I was there praying, and I remember the Lord saying to me one phrase. And as he said this phrase, I said, Lord, what is this about? And here's what he said to me, 33 and a half years in a day. And I, I, I was, I, I, my face did one of these. And I said, Lord, what is that? And he said it again, 33 and a half years in one day. And the second time he said it, my, 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 everything that he meant was right pregnant in that, in that statement. And I said, no way, Lord, no, that cannot be possible. And I got up and I went over to my Bible and I started flipping from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what I found, I could not believe. Are you ready? The life of Christ. 33 and a half years is a pattern by which you and I are to live our lives every day. Whew. And I said, Lord, please tell me, what do you mean? And he said, listen, when you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you need to do? What's the first thing you need to experience? And I thought, Lord, I need to be born again. Yeah. 
And amazingly enough, when I am born again, guess what? God gives me three gifts. (laughs) (laughs) Gold, frankincense, and what? And myrrh. So I get up in the morning and I begin to see Christ's life and pray through his life. And I say, Lord, help me to be born again. Lord, give me the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. And then the Lord says to me, my son, I want you to know that Herod is going to try to get you this morning. Herod's going to try to wipe you out before you, you mature too much in your Christian walk. So be careful. Watch out for Herod. And Herod may come in. The, ooh, Herod has his ways of coming. In the morning. Anybody ever ever experienced Herod in the morning? But then, beloved, God says, if you trust in me, I will take care of you. And so we go, we walk through the life of Christ in the morning. We get past Herod. And, beloved, it's interesting because when, when, when we begin to think of the life of Christ and think of how he grew up as a child, I begin to ask the Lord, Lord, help me to live the kind of life you lived as a child. You see, beloved, I can't live like the man Jesus Christ if I have not lived first like the child, Jesus Christ. We're trying to bear the cross, and we just skipped the whole rest of his life. Trying to walk like him, and we have skipped everything else. Quite interesting, beloved, at the age of 12, Jesus discovered what his mission was. Every morning before we get up and head out the doors, we should what? We should know what our mission is. The Lord will speak to us and tell us, this is what I want you to do today. And if our ears are open, we will hear it. Amen? Amen. And then, beloved, we get all the way down to Christ. You know, Christ, uh, uh, from the age of 12 on, he began to work in his father's shop as a carpenter. Beloved, we ought to pray, Lord, help me as I go through my day to work as diligently in my job as you worked as a carpenter. You see, we're living the what? Life of Christ. And then, beloved, beautifully, at age 30, the Bible says he was baptized. Every morning, I need to be praying, Lord, baptize me with your spirit. And it's beautiful because the Bible says that a voice came and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Any of you interested in hearing that voice spoken over you on a daily basis? This is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. And then, beloved, he will send a heavenly dove. (laughs) He will send a heavenly dove on your shoulder to walk with you throughout the day. Anybody need that heavenly dove? But you know what happens next, right? He's led up into the wilderness, and and he is tempted three times. And, beloved, you've got to realize that, that throughout the day, the devil is going to try to tempt you to turn stone into bread. Take that which is unlawful for you to partake of and sanctify it. Make it all right. And you say, no, I'm not going to do that. And he says, okay, well, why don't, you, uh, why don't you just throw yourself down because you know you're going to fall sometime anyway. Throw yourself down into this sin and God will forgive you later. And you say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And then he'll say, well, you know what, look, if you just look, you know it's wrong, I know it's wrong. You just bow down and do this for me one time and then I'll give you everything you want. Beloved, you, come, you overcome all those by the weapons that Christ has given you. Amen? <clears throat> and then you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Can you imagine? You just spent your morning in prayer, and now you get up, and you walk into your kitchen, and your wife looks at you like, wow. He has returned in the power of the Spirit. <laughs> What's been going on this morning, honey? I've been living, what? The life of Christ. And beloved, as you go about, your whole day now is about turning water into what? Wine. That was his first miracle. Taking things which are mundane, you going out and and blessing someone, you going out and giving a word to someone, all that, beloved, is considered turning water into wine. Making the gospel sweet for those 
who partake of it. Amen? Amen? That's what God has called you to do. And so you go throughout the day, and you know what? At some point in that day, you've got to come aside and rest a while. So sometime through the day, you come back, you take a break, you go and you talk to Jesus again, and then it's back onto the work field, and you go throughout the day, and now we're down to the evening time, beloved, and what time is it in the life of Christ at the evening time, beloved? It is a time for the Last Supper. Oh, man, you're not getting it. It's time for the evening meal. Oh, I just... <laughs> Beloved, it's time to gather the family around like Jesus gathered his disciples around. And it's time, beloved, to love one another over that evening meal. It's time to wash each other's feet. Is there anything I've done to offend you? Is there anything I've done to offend you? And it's time, beloved, to make sure that everything is good with everybody and you don't have any Judases in your family that are going to eventually betray Jesus. Amen? And then, beloved, after you, you know, get all the kids in bed and, and you say goodbye to good night to everybody, it's time for you to go alone to the garden. Huh? You are living the life of Christ. It's time for you to go to the garden because you know that tomorrow is going to be an incredible day and you need everything in your power to stand up in light of the conflicts and the trials you will need for the next day. Amen? Amen. And beloved, then you get up and you are ready to be nailed to the cross. And you know what will happen? Between the time that you get up and the time that you go to bed, you know what the devil's going to be doing? He's going to be trying to get you down from the cross. He will try to do everything in his power so that you do not go to sleep without first honoring him. Come on. So you just got up from your evening prayer and the phone rings and it's the kind of phone call that you wish you didn't get. And you hear the devil's voice saying, come down from the cross, man. Are you going to take that? <laughs> Did you hear what he just said to you? But, beloved, by God's grace, you can say, I will not come down from this cross. Love is going to hold me up here. Amen? And, beloved, as you lay down to bed, as you lay down, and sleep begins to come over you, and your eyes begin to close, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about Jesus on the cross. As his eyes began to close, and what do you pray before you go to bed? Father, into thy hands I commit my... Do you know the devil cannot penetrate the life of Christ? See, if you live the life of Christ, that's the greatest weapon we have. If you live his life, there's no way the devil can get in it because Christ lived it for us. Amen? And all we've got to do is walk in it. But, beloved, it doesn't end there because the Bible tells us <laughs> that Herod is going to have soldiers around your bedside in the morning. Make sure he doesn't get up. And so the Roman soldiers are there around your bed. The alarm clock goes off, and one of them quietly picks up your hand. And hits the alarm clock. <laughs> yeah? Anybody ever had a Roman soldier by your bedside? <laughs> Keep sleeping. Don't get up so that you have enough time to pray. Keep him sleeping. Don't break the Roman seal. But, beloved, I love it because the Bible says that the Father sent an angel from heaven, and that angel caused an earthquake, and the angel said, Son, thy father called. <laughs> 
Thy Father calleth thee, beloved, every morning, if you will listen carefully enough, Jesus will send his angel and say, Son, daughter, I'm calling you. Get up. We've got to talk. And beloved, when you get up, let me tell you, when the, when, the, when the business of life begins to come in and you haven't prayed yet, when, when the phone starts ringing and when all these things start happening, you know what you can say? You can say, touch me not. <laughs> you thought I was making this stuff up? <laughs> touch me not, for I have not yet ascended. To my father. Yeah. You see, beloved, when we begin to understand the, the life of Christ, the power of Christ, the weapons of Christ, he gives us so much that we've got to say, how in the world can I turn my back on this? Beloved, he goes, anybody ever heard of a download? You know what a download is? Beloved, Jesus goes as far as to say, listen, when you are praying through my life, don't just ask to do the things that I did. Ask to download my thoughts and my feelings so that they become your own thoughts and feelings. So when, when you see me there on the cross, ask the Holy Spirit, what was Jesus thinking and feeling as he was on the cross? And then you say, Lord, download those thoughts and feelings into my mind. So now, what do I have going on? My mind is beholding the mind of Christ, and all of a sudden, my mind is beginning to be changed by beholding. And I close with this thought, beloved. Do you know that in the last days, the final test will be a test of thought reflex? You see, beloved, when, 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 when that final crisis comes upon God's people and, and the enemy gathers in all his forces and he's got all these weapons, thought bombs, feel bombs, sleep bombs, uh, 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 you know, everything that I've named and more. The test will be whose weapons are more powerful. And beloved, in that day, it will not be about our knowledge of who the beast is because our knowledge of who the beast is is not going to help us when somebody spits in your face. The question then is going to be, whose thoughts and feelings do you have? And beloved, let me tell you, by nature, you know, you ever been to the doctor and he takes out that little hammer and, you sit and he hits you and what happens? Reflex. It is our reflex to respond in our own ways, in our own thoughts, in our own feelings. Someone does something, we retaliate immediately. But beloved, in the last days, God is going to have a people who pass the thought reflex test. The devil is going to do all he can and it will be seen that they have reflexively, if that's a word, they, they, they now understand they have so beheld the Lamb of God that now when temptation and crisis comes, it is simply reflex for them to respond like Jesus. Beloved, we have a tremendous battle ahead of us. A tremendous warfare. And Christ says, I will equip you with everything you need. Beloved, how many of you want to be equipped tonight? How many of you want to be empowered tonight? Beloved, Jesus is knocking at the door and he's saying, if you will let me in, I will do things in your life that will confound the enemy. Heavenly Father, You have spoken to us tonight, Lord. Father, we are in need of your power and of your grace. We're in need of your mind and your life. Father, we are in need of your spirit. 
father we have been bombarded by the tools of the enemy and now Lord our eyes have been opened and we see the reality of the conflict before us grant us everything we need that we may be able to stand and having done all to stand we may be found worthy not because of ourselves but because of you because of your son thank you Lord for speaking to us tonight in Jesus name we pray amen amen Thank you.